Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Oli Damagard returns to the show. Oli is one of the preeminent researchers studying and exposing the dark business of assassination and false flags. Oli's work is completely self-funded, so if you could take a moment after the show and visit his website, lightonconspiracies.com, and consider donating or sponsoring his work, Oli would be greatly appreciative. For tonight's discussion, Oli shares his insights into the Berlin and other recent false flags and how these events follow a predictable template. We also discuss the importance of vetting sources of alternative information and how the art of psychological warfare is everywhere. And so without further ado, here's Oli Damagard. Oli, thank you so much for coming back. It's been uh, probably a few months since the last time you've been on the show. A lot has happened. False flags. Before we started the show, you mentioned Berlin. Uh, we have also the whole pedophilia aspect that's playing out worldwide, especially here in the United States. Also, before we got started, you talked about air toxic syndrome on the airplane, and you, I guess you had just gotten back from a trip, and you had some side effects from this? <clears throat> I found out, uh, since I do a lot of flying because of these conferences and talks and stuff, I I find that it's almost every single time I get home, I have like a week, two weeks with this really bad cough, a uh, really deep cough that is sort of like, uh, you know, it really feels like you, you have swallowed sandpaper or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> my friend Willem Felderhof, who's a former, former commercial pilot for 25 years, he he explained these things to me and he said, this is not just an ordinary cough. It is what is called air toxic syndrome, where the whole thing is that um, it's uh, with the uh, planes equipped with jet engines. When, as far as I understand it, when the, the engines get uh, sort of used over the years, they start leaking oil and uh, this oil in the engines then get heated and compressed. And since all the air that comes into the pl airplane itself for us to breathe goes through the engines for some stupid reason, I would say. Uh, this is exactly what we, we breathe in. And uh, uh, according to Willem and uh, quite a few other people, he, he became a whistleblower for 14 years trying to expose this whole thing because thousands of people in the crew and passengers and so on have been having very, very odd uh, sim symptoms <clears throat> because of this and uh, so one of the things that he told me recently was that uh, just by using a uh, sort of like an air filter uh, especially one with like a breathing uh, vent in it yeah uh, it can help i was i was going to send you a link that maybe you can post together with a show for some of the filters that he's been recommended uh, he says that it's 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 especially in the beginning of the flight when you're still on on the ground when you when the pilot accelerates or d what do you call it decelerate decelerate can you say yeah yeah the engines that is where uh, this whole thing comes and <clears throat> he says there if the pilots were aware of this i hope maybe some pilots are listening now uh you can, by accelerating the engines before turning on the airflow into the cabin, uh, that is one way of sort of like airing some of these uh, toxics out before uh, you go uh, on the flight. But most, uh, since this is not standard procedure, most pilots are not aware of it. So they just, you know, accelerate and it just pumps all of this crap into the cabin for us to breathe for the rest of the flight. And uh, there's a, uh, you can feel it sometimes when, when you're still on the ground and they're testing the engines. And then you can, you can hear when they, they turn on the air condition or the air intake. And there's this smell of like a wet dog or an old sock, that type of thing. That is the one. Okay. And he says that is the one uh, where it really hits you. But also in flight, not, not when you cr in cruise mode. It's not so much there, but then when you start descending, that's where it starts uh, pumping in as well. And also this in combination with all the chemtrails crap that is uh, in the air that comes in through the same way, get compressed, heated. And especially when it gets compressed and heated, that is when it gets even more uh, toxic, you know, and, and, and violent to the body systems. So... 
I, for one, am going to use one of these air filters. I'm going to look like an absolute stupid uh, <laughs> fool, but I am so happy. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to paint like a smiley face <laughs> on, on it or something like that to to take away or just, you know, put it on and go to sleep. And so mm-hmm. nobody else, well, they can wonder whatever they want. And I also want to point out that in the airports, please be aware of these body scanners. Yes, they say that they are not uh, sending out any radiation. This is what the people uh, that are using them are working in these places are being informed. So they believe that they're doing the right thing, as we all do, uh, since all of these things are totally compartmentalized. So you are not aware of your part uh, of the machine type of thing. But these uh, machines that are built by the same people uh, that are behind so much other mayhem in the world uh, can really damage your body, your DNA, also your DNA, and really things that we have no idea about. So please be aware that there is this thing as opt out. You can just say thank you, but no thank you. I'm not going through that machine. Yep. And then they will say, yeah, but uh, you don't you know that it's totally harmless? There's no problem. That's their job to say that, and they believe it. So. Just give them a very nice smile and say, thank you, but no, thank you, I'm not going. Then they will ask you, but why? And my, I've, I've said that it's because of health problems. Then they start discussing. La- the latest one, when I, I've just done a, a, a mini tour in, in the UK, I just say it's because of principles. And they yeah. say, okay, fine. So you have a body search and said they, they just do the whole thing. Up and down. I'm happy to do that. You know, go for it. Whatever you want to do, go for it. And then they say, but uh, we have to write down why you opt out. Oh, okay, fine. Principles. Okay, he wrote it down and that's it. Thank you and goodbye. And uh, one less thing that will hurt my body. Yeah, I opt out all the time. I, I never go through them. And uh, they never actually asked me why I didn't want to go through it. They, they didn't ask any questions. They just do the pat down. And then the pat down takes like what? Four or five minutes? Yeah, sometimes they take you into a, a special room, big deal. So you just have a nice time there, you know. I'm just totally silent, just smiling all the time and just uh, not say anything except for what they ask for. And uh, Yeah, and I want to make it clear to the audience that I'm, I'm not happy with being pat down either. It's just it's be, you have to travel, so you either have to be pat down or you get irradiated. I choose to pat down over being irradiated. Me too, any time of the day. And also, once again, the people that are working there uh, truly believe that what they've been instructed, that, but that is not the truth. I think what they're going to find, Oli, given maybe another 10 years or so, that many of these people who work at the airports that are by those machines all the time. They'll have diseases. They're going to have a lot of problems. Yeah. A lot I'm of problems. You're going to see a lot of cancers and those types of diseases are going to crop up. Yeah, yep. I totally agree. And this is also when you look at the people working there, it's often people from minorities, uh, people with dark skin, people and so on. And this is the normal type of, of procedure, how, how uh, people uh, from these uh, parts of life are, are treated worse than most others. Yeah. You know? And I'm sure it's really badly paid as well, so it's just the same old story again and again. Yeah, yeah. It's the same, you know, page out of the same playbook, like you said, over and over. Now, only there's been some false flags, and uh, <laughs> and you are our resident expert on false flags. So where did you want to start? I would like to say, uh, if you hadn't noticed, there was a presidential election last year in the U.S., and... About a month or so before that, ISIS and the other terrorist organizations in the world decided that, well, we we might as well follow what's going on here, so we're not going to do anything. So for about at least a month before the election, everything calmed down. There was, as far as I know, nothing, 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 and nothing. Then the election took place, and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then on the very same day when... President Trump was sealed in as the next president on December 19th. On more or less the exact same hour that that happened, there were three different attacks here in Europe. I ask you, what are the chances? What are the chances? Uh, so 
what are we looking at? Are we looking at a distraction? Are we looking at interference? Are we, is it some kind of attack sort of indirectly aimed at Trump or how is, how is it co coordinated? I'm not sure. I just want to point out the timing of the whole thing. And <clears throat> if we start at, in Berlin, it's like, do you remember we in, in many other of these, uh, um, sort of series of events, there is like a theme almost. It's, it's like a, a theme there. There's the Lassie theme, you know, how to get emotional. There's the, um, veterans themes. There's the, and here from the 19th of, of December, just before Christmas, there was this Santa Claus theme that was just ridiculous. It was just all over the place. Santa, 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 Santa. It didn't matter if it was in Istanbul or in Fort Lauderdale or in, in Berlin and so on. So I'm going to point them out uh, because if you also remember, it is almost like a Dan Brown novel where they put clues for the next upcoming event to take place. They put it in the hidden in plain sight for us to find or not to find because uh, for some bizarre reason, they need our consent to be able to pull these things off. If we, if we say, no, we don't want this, you know, when we see the signs and we say, absolutely not, they will not do it, but it's because we are so brain dead and so asleep that they keep on doing it. So that is why I've put such a focus on finding the clues and putting it out there, hopefully to even be able to, to stop the, the next one. And today I'm going to end with maybe, um, what I believe could be the next target. Okay. So in Berlin, what happened in Berlin? False flag operations are uh, operations that are carried out by an elite few, the few in power <clears throat> that have, um, as through so many centuries, uh, wanted to find different methods of how can the elite few, they call themselves the elite, I do not, uh, how can these few people control the masses? And the, the answer every single time, it's only through fear. It is inflicted fear, especially from the outside, that can make them, us normal people, turn towards the people that we have elected, at least we believe we have, and that they are there in a position to protect us, not understanding that very often it's actually them who have created the problem. It's an old Roman ta tactic called problem, reaction, solution. We've, we've covered that many, many times. Yes. So here we have uh, a, a target, uh, a terror attack in Berlin. It's almost identical to the one in Nice that we covered and that I hope that we totally debunked, showing that it was not true, the official story whatsoever, but a whole false flag setup. And here we have the exact same thing, more or less. Uh, there was a Christmas market <clears throat> in the center of Berlin. And when you look at the, these attacks, there, the location where it, it happens is very important. The timing is very important. And also who they blame it uh, on is very important. It is said that uh, there was this... Uh, guy of Tunisian background, this is identical to Nice, uh, who said that uh, for no apparent reason, I'm very pissed off, so I'm going to kill a lot of people. So he hijacked a Polish truck. This is the first time when Poland has started uh, getting involved. There will be several of these where it started to point towards Poland and other Eastern uh, European countries, which is an interesting new sort of direction because it's, as far as I know has not happened before anyway this uh, young guy he hijacked this uh, truck in the afternoon he killed the, tr the truck driver uh, drove around with a dead body in the passenger seat and then <clears throat> at uh, two minutes past eight in the evening he just uh, came drove into the center of Berlin and went straight into a big Christmas market where it is said that he killed 12 people, just went straight in between the Christmas huts and massacred 12 people and injured some 50 other people. 
Then the truck came to a full stop. He escaped, and he they say that he um, uh, fled through several different countries until he was stopped by Italian police a few days later and shot down. Uh, they, they more or less said hello and shot him. That was it. So let's have a look at what happened. <clears throat> When you look at this area, once again, we have a very, very specific location. It's right outside the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, which is the symbol, the symbol for Berlin and for the strength of, of Berlin. Just like 9-11 was the, the symbol of the U.S. and New York and so on, Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial, that is the church. And you will see it right in, in the background behind so many of these photos. And on many of the photos, check out the the clock on the church tower, and it says 9/11. Of course. Surprise, surprise! Here we go again, because they're in these. We're we're talking about psyops again. Okay. So, is it possible that this actually happened the way we're being told? Let's have a look. It is said that uh, um, the truck came with about 40 miles an hour. But when you look at it, it, there was a dash cam that uh, that filmed it when it came uh, and entered into the area. But when you see the dash cam footage, which is very blurred, you only see a silhouette of the truck. You will see that he doesn't even hit the hit the brakes to get into like an almost 90 degree turn, and then a, another right after that another 90 degree turn to the left. I mean, with a truck like that, I'm a former truck driver. It will totally what do you call it, jackknife uh, the vehicle. And also you would just, everything on the left-hand side, you know, when you make a, a 90 degree left turn, the, the the rear of the truck will not do the same maneuver as a normal car. It will just like cut straight across. And here you see the truck passes the entrance to the Christmas market where it's said to have entered and doesn't even slow down. Then you go into the area where it said that it's killed all of these people. It's only like a hundred yards in total. And so it's said to have hit like around 62 people, 12 dead and some 50 injured. And then it came to a full stop where it's standing out in the main street. But when you look at it, there are like these metal boulders uh, that are only like five, uh, five, six um, feet apart. Meaning that you cannot get, you cannot drive the truck in between them. So what I'm strongly suggesting, since none of these boulders are damaged in any way or form or even scratched, is that the truck passed, reversed back, and got itself in position. Uh, I've got plenty of photos where you can see one of these metal boulders right up behind the truck in the center of the truck. Meaning, it's impossible. It, the truck would have knocked it over, it would have made massive damage to the front of the truck to to knock one of these over because they are heavy duty uh, type of things. Then you have also <clears throat> the, the lighting in the Christmas market area. There were these strings of, of bulbs, light bulbs, but the light bulbs are uh, way further down than the height of the truck. And the, when you see, see the footage afterwards, the, the these light bulbs are still there even though the truck is said to have passed right underneath it, it would have just torn the whole thing down. Then you have a photographer, a German photographer, who came there 90 seconds after <clears throat> after it happened. And his name is Jan Hollitzer. He is the online chef of the Berlin Morgan Post. You will see here, once again, people interviewed, people, witnesses, and people on location so often connected to media. And here we had CNN and BBC on location before German media was even there. Not bad. Pretty fast moving. Anyway, so you see this uh, guy, uh, Jan Hollitzer, he's there. His his camera just passes the, the church tower. So you, you can see the time and you count backwards uh, to the time he started filming. So he started filming about 90 seconds after the official uh when impact of the truck. So you will see he's very calm. He's walking around camera, mostly downwards, blurred, 
once again blurred. What is the matter with these cameras that are always blurred when it comes to filming victims? Uh, it's very dark. You can't uh, see any real uh, facial features of people walking around. And people in this Christmas market are walking around, you know, arm in arm, uh, old women with their handbag, just walking around like nothing happened. 90 seconds after a truck had just massacred through a crowd. There are yeah. no people screaming. There's no moaning. There's three people sitting being taken care of, you know, when he, because he's walking around talking while he's filming. I had a guy on location just the day or so after, same lighting, same location, a similar type of camera, super sharp images, good lighting, all of these things compared to the official. You know, you can't even compare it. So <clears throat> also he keeps filming. He's walking around and he walks up to where the truck is standing. There's nobody trying to sort of pull out the bodies underneath the truck because we only see three wounded people. That means that there should be maybe somewhere around 59 people underneath the truck because otherwise, where are they? Nobody is bothering to do that. And when the camera passes the area behind the truck, you will see there's four people out in the street diverting the traffic. Okay. And also there's a big yellow bus that is standing there with hazard lights on. And that truck, that bus is standing there for more than 24 hours inside uh, the, the corner of the police area. Why? Because extras are driven in and out. For on location in these buses. Also the truck, I would strongly suggest that the debris that are in the street around the truck was inside the truck. It came with the whole thing. You will also see there's some footage where people have been, uh, filmed the whole thing before uh, the ambulances and so came. And you will see that people are walking around very calmly and there's no debris around the truck. And then the longer they film and people are walking around there, more and more debris are put around the truck. Nothing under, but on the sides and to the side. I tell you, absolute stage <laughs> false flag crap. Not good at all. Now, Oli, in the background, we have these people walking around calmly. So is it your view that all of these people are crisis actors, if all of these people have been contracted to participate in this event? We're not talking about all these people. We're talking about maybe 30, 40 in, in total. Okay. And, and like I mentioned before, I, I truly believe that m what we're looking at with many of these state, uh, these attacks, so-called attacks, I think we're looking at a global group tour. I mean, like a Rocky horror show on global tour. That it's the same people walking around in the background in Melbourne, as in Sydney, as in Ottawa, as in Denmark, as in, in Paris, as in Berlin. Just because they, they run around in German police uniforms does not mean that they're German police. Yeah. Just because they run around in German SWAT team uniforms do not, does not prove that they're German SWAT teams. And why are they always having masks on? You know, there's a reason for that. Oh, their security. No, they should be there for our security and for us not to be even able to identify these elite soldiers that are there to protect us is, it's totally turned upside down. I think you're right. There's like a troop of people that go around the world putting these false flags into play. I'm telling you, we're looking at a small little group. This massive terror problem is tiny, tiny, tiny. It's like Pink Floyd on global tour <coughs> with the whole logistic uh, thing more, almost identical. I mean, you need catering, you need makeup, you need um, smoke bombs, you need explosives, you need uh, bodyguards, you need marketing agency. It's the same. It is the same. But these people are being transported, I believe, in, in army planes from NATO, uh, NATO base or American uh, Air Force bases flown in and then transported in these buses. You will always see these buses uh, on location. They do their thing. They have their drill first so that they can rehearse, 
get all the equipment, everything in location, in position, camera crews, smoke bombs, explosives, whatever is needed, crisis actors, and then boom, they carry it out in front of the cameras. They film it themselves. The normal people are not allowed near at the very time. They're they're very discreetly diverted away from the actual th- uh, place when it happens. And because all of this terror is aimed at being pumped out through media, they don't care about this. What whoever sees it in Berlin, in the center of Berlin, this is aimed for international impact. You know, fear porn globally. Right. Right. Do you ever wonder to yourself with some of these folks that are brought on as crisis actors? Let's say they're not part of the uh, the permanent entourage that goes around the world putting these events on and staging them. But, you know, these are people that are contracted maybe locally to have as uh, props in the background. You ever think to yourself that what type of person would participate in this? And, and I'm sure that when they uh, are brought into um, into the event, they're told it's a drill. And so initially, you're like, okay, so you're going to pay me to be in a drill and you want me to be in the background and so on. So you do your bit and you get paid. But what type of person the next day or two days later sees the whole thing splattered all over the media as some kind of horrible event when you know that that's not what happened at all? that it was a drill and nobody got hurt and, and so on, that it was staged, and you say nothing. I mean, you don't step up to the plate and say, well, you know what, I was paid to be there, and this was a drill, and I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how it went from a drill to what's on the TV screen right now, because that's nothing but a staged psyop, that's propaganda that's being broadcast. These people that get contracted on an interim basis to participate in these things, they never say a word. They never raise their hand and say, wait a minute, I don't get it. Well, the thing is that when when you sign up as a crisis actor, I would very strongly suggest that they are signing confidentiality papers. Yeah, true. And not really understanding what they're signing before they suddenly are in a situation where like, whoa, hang on, hang on. And then they're suddenly by law uh, kept silent. And I spoke to Chip Tatum, the CIA whistleblower, my friend, who he he used to uh, be part of, he was part of, of false flag operations in his career. <clears throat> I asked him about this. How do you keep them quiet? He said it's super simple. He says it's fear as usual. Uh, what you do is you pay them well. You use a very small unit. You use the same people again and again and again, which we see. We see the same Police chief in six different, you know, three different states. We see the same woman. I don't know how many times I've, I've uh, identified the same woman at five or six different uh, places, Boston, Sandy Hook, many other places, same actors. I would very strongly suggest that uh, uh, when you looked at the description, for instance, of the three shooters in, in Paris, there was especially three individuals that were described as... Uh, very well built European um, um, sort of mercenary looking types in dark military clothes that did some actual shooting. If there was actual shooting at all in in the November 13th uh, massacre. That was the same description in San Bernardino, by the way, by two witnesses. And Mike, if you if I had finished the sentence, I would say that is the exact same description as the shooters in San Bernardino just a few days later. So I'm telling you what we're seeing is that being flown from place to place and they use the same people. And what they do is the shooter is like in the exact description in dark military unit uh, clothes, these type of clothes. So they do the shooting. And then they duck down while the SWAT team is moving in, put on their mask that the SWAT teams have. And then you have like 10 people in the SWAT team moving in and 13 people in the SWAT team moving out. All of them with masks. Where did the shooters go? They, they left that way. This is how they do it. They use uniforms on a very regular basis as a diversion. You know, you, you don't even notice them. You're looking for the bad guys. These people that were in Paris, San Bernardino, I swear, the exact same people. This is why it's so important for us not to see these as separate events. They are connected. And anyone who doubts me, please understand 
when NATO has an exercise, very often there are like up to 14, 15 different countries involved, including the US. And these are NATO terror um, exercises or, or operations. It's to, that's what we're talking about. That is what we're talking about. And this is also why it keeps repeating in the same countries, only NATO countries. In here we have Denmark, uh, Sweden has started uh, popping up more and more, even though Sweden has been neutral, not. They've, they've been part of NATO since 1954, but not on the paper. Uh, you have Turkey, you have the, the UK, you have the Belgium, Germany, France, uh, these are the ones that it keeps, uh, maybe I forgot some, but uh, these are where it, it, it keeps repeating re again and again. And you got Canada and Australia, which is also connected by, by different uh, so-called security agreements. So these are the countries where it just, it's like a revolving show, you know, like, okay, next time here, next time there, next time here, next time there. And you have to have a standard cast of characters, only It only makes sense because otherwise what you'd have to do, first of all, it's easy, like you said, it's more easily contained when you have a group of people that this is what they do, this is what they're trained to do, and so on. If you start trying to expand that out and you try to get more people to participate, you really run the risk of, of exposing what's going on. So you do want to keep it contained, and plus it costs money to train. Right. So you don't want to have turnover. You want to have a core group that this is what they do. And, you know, so I agree with you 100 percent that this is all a package, if you will. And these these people go about their business across the world trying to inflict fear and terror into people. I, I never got to what Chip said. He said that if somebody first you pay them well, because money is not an, a problem at all. He said that most of the time when he was flying uh, in in these operations, he had between 25,000 and 250,000 in his pocket that was standard to pay off people in the airport, to pay off, you know, money, absolutely not an option. They even printed themselves. So that is not uh, anything even to consider. So he, he says, you pay them well. Many times these people are not super intelligent either. Uh, intelligent either. They're sort of like not good actors because all the good ones are already taken and would be recognized. Uh, from films and so on. So you you need to use unknown actors. This is also why you have this problem that they're really bad at it. And you have this problem with duping delight as well, where they're standing smiling while talking about how ISIS chopped the head of their dad or something like that. And then he says, if somebody should uh, get like second thoughts, one of the thing is you will always see these bouncers. They They look in the in the outskirts of the area where these things happen, you will see these. They look like former military guys, uh, but, you know, like not super um, uh, well trained because they would stick out and look like military. These are yeah. um, former military people, I would say. You you often see them with military caps or military diff different symbols or things on their cap. But they're just like standing there smoking or fiddling around with a cell phone or whatever. But they're there to make sure that no normal people enter into this area, the target area, and none of the, the actors leave. You know, this is also you will often see them stand next to uh, somebody who's been wounded and so on, officially wounded. But they don't even care. They don't really care. They're, they're standing there looking concerned, but they're actually looking in all different direction, not at the, where this person is, uh, is uh, wounded or helping them in any way or form. So these people are also there to control uh, and keep them like these. These are mobsters, more or less, you know, to, to bodyguards, to keep them uh, away, compartmentalized away. And then Chip said that should anyone get like second thoughts and start, to, you know, um, well, thinking about getting out or, or telling, he said it's very easy. What you do is you just scare them, you know. Uh, you beat someone up in front of the group. You kill someone in front of the group. You kill their dog, their grandmother, or something like that. And that will most of the time be very efficient and shut down the whole idea of leaving or becoming a whistleblower. Yeah, that's very effective. It's fear again. 
you know, it's fear again. Yeah. So this is why, how is it possible? How is it possible? Also, you got, you got like, uh, uh, different mind control, um, methods as well. You know, you got different drugs they can use, like scopolamine and stuff where people have no idea for like three, four hours what they're doing. They will do everything they're ordered to. And afterward, they will have no memory of what they did. If the only thing is that they will have a, a dry taste in the mouth. This is scopolamine is something really, it's called the voodoo drug or, or I mean, it's the devil's drug. It's an awful thing made from a white trumpet flower from, from Chile, the mountains in Chile. Uh, but that's another one. And I, I, with the CAA and, uh, and Mossad and these other agencies, I'm sure they have very sophisticated type of drugs and cocktails to do this thing with people, you know, where they can control them for a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah, there's no question about it that they have um, they have technology, they have the means, they have the drugs. And I just chuckled a little bit before when you said they even print their own money. They do. You know, it, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just people will sometimes say, well, where do they get all the money for all this stuff and so on? Well, it's pretty easy when you have a printing machine <laughs> and you can print your you, own You print currency. it and normal people pay the debt. For every every new uh, bill they print, we have to pay the debt. Where does the debt come from? This national debt, where does it come from? How come it keeps growing? How come the U.S. have such a massive foreign debt when you are lending out money to other countries? Go figure. How does it work? It doesn't. It's a whole massive scam. So, Oli, what about uh, – I don't want to switch gears on you, so if I'm getting ahead of you, just tell me and I'll, and I'll pull back. But what about what like what's going on in Paris, as an example, or even – the riots are recently in Sweden. I mean, is this all tied in? I think it is big time. I told you the, I mean, for the last 15 years or something like that, I and many other researchers have been very aware of that. They're going to hit us with this mass invasion of refugees in Europe and so on and in the U S and, but that is totally part of their design, how to divide and conquer. And what better way than divide by color, divide by religion, uh, divide by social standards, you know, different uh, uh, levels in society and so on. And But I, I totally doubt everything at this point when it comes to media. I do not believe it at all. Because, for instance, like there was this... Um, so-called terror attack in Sweden. Sweden is a very, very soft uh, version of uh, terror when it comes to, if you compare it. And there was this um, schoolboy that uh, <clears throat> he was dressed like uh, Darth Vader who came to school and stabbed three other people there and then got killed by the police. They say, I've been there. I could not even find his grave or anything like that. Uh, but the very same morning when this happened, which was the first time in Sweden, like a really like, whoa, you know, it happened in the city, uh, Trollhättan, which is uh, one of the most uh, populated by uh, foreigners or immigrants, you know. And then uh, the the other, uh, he, he was said to be, be Swedish, the guy who did it, but the, the victims were foreigners, immigrants. And the, so you have this whole mix in it, you know, because your mind just goes immigrants and violence and terrorism and whoa, whoa, whoa. Like the very same morning uh, before this happened in the Swedish newspaper, it said now 194,000 new immigrants are in Sweden at the, you know, have just crossed the borders. So I have been asking people in Sweden, have you seen them? It's 194,000 the immigrants, have you seen them? And people have said, yes, I have. I saw them. They were in the train station. So how many did you see? Was there 194,000 exactly or no, but there was at least maybe a couple of hundred. Okay, that's 194,000 minus 200, 300 top, you know. So be, let's be generous. 193,000 is then left. Where are they? Where did they go? Yeah, but there were some in Malmö as well in the south of Sweden. Okay, so how many? We're talking in the hundreds. 
were they the same as the other in the other train station? Do you see what, what I'm saying? Is you you enter? It's a they play our minds. In my opinion, it's like sometimes I saw uh, they they had like. Uh, Articles in, in, in newspapers saying every fourth woman in Sweden has now been raped. It's like you go to Sweden, it's totally peaceful. It's like, no, absolutely not. Yeah, but I, I read it in the newspaper. It does not mean a thing. And now the rate has gone up like, uh, and they, they put like, so it looked like 4,000%. The rape uh, percentage had gone up. But when you looked at it, there was a small little zero. In front of it, and then a comma, so it was like zero point, and then four percent. So, are you saying that the numbers, that these numbers, are exaggerated as far as the uh, the immigrants coming in from the Middle East into these countries, and then also statistics and data with regard to rapes and those types of things are also being played up? That the situation is not anywhere near what they're reporting is that what you're saying my theory my experience absolutely it is nowhere near anything but what do i know i i can't be everywhere and count people and see exactly what's going on i have to trust information being sent to me or through media and stuff but i know <clears throat> we live in the southernmost point uh, point of spain we can see i can see out through the window i can see gibraltar i can see morocco Okay. According to media, people in Morocco are desperate to get here. They're sort of like jumping on trucks in Tangier. They're dying. They're get, grabbing boats coming illegally here. You know, people drowning. There's a, we have been here for 16 years. I have not seen one boat. I have not seen one refugee. I have not seen any drowned people coming up on the beaches. What, what is it? Do you know? But if you look in new in the media, it's like, oh my God, here they are again, and the and uh, the the what do you call the boat, the custom boats uh, interjected, uh, took over boats and hijacked them. We can see it. There's no boats. So what about a country like Germany, where it's in the news just about every day about you know what's going on in Germany? I mean, the the news is is broadcasting it as total chaos with these Middle Eastern refugees coming in. The German government under Merkel basically doing absolutely nothing about it. German women being molested, raped, uh, and so on. So is is the... Now can I just say, yeah, you God. said the key word. The government, Merkel, is doing nothing about it. Why are they not doing nothing? Because they want the chaos. This is the thing. They're part of creating it. That is also the, the thing with Sweden and other countries. They're totally opening the doors and normal Swedish people are saying, oh my God, close it, close it. What's going on? We, but they're not allowed to say anything because then you will be called a racist, you know. But I've asked in many interviews, you know, to people in Germany and so on, you please contact me. Look out through the window. What are you seeing? Are you seeing people being raped in every street corner? Are there refugees everywhere? Are there violence? Are there riots? Nobody says anything. And if you look at the New World Order, if you look at the books written by people in the so-called elite, this has been on the agenda for a long time. This is how they do it. And if you don't want a lot of refugees coming to your country, stop bombing their countries. They will not leave their countries if you don't bomb them. So Merkel and NATO countries, other people like, if it's a problem, then stop dropping bombs on them. The way I was looking at it is that uh, they want the refugees going into these European countries because what they want to do is they want to homogenize the culture. Yeah. And uh, so I, I read an article, I guess, only about two or three months ago. There was an analysis done that said that by the year 2030, I think it was, they said current rate and pace of what's going on. If these refugees are actually coming in in the numbers that they're claiming that Germans will be a minority in their own country by 2030. And this is what all the different countries are saying. I, that is exactly what I've read in Sweden. That is exactly what I've heard from people in England. It is fear mongering, you know, it, and also what they want to, they want to destroy the national identity. They want to destroy the national cultures. They want to destroy all of these things. 
what is good is what I love about this new world order in one way is that they're doing a lot of good, uh, but their intention is very dark. So if like, for instance, uh, here in Europe, there were, there were borders everywhere and border controls everywhere in Europe before. And now they're not. We can travel freely, you know, just like you in the States and so on, which is beautiful in one way. So it's just that they're doing a lot of things because, but their agenda and their intention is very evil and dark, I would say. But if we can transcend this whole thing, th we will be helped from some of their efforts as well. It's just that part of this mass immigration problem is totally part of their agenda with George Soros in the background, even handing out, you know, like uh, small little books on how to behave like an immigrant and they're paying them extra to do riots and paying them extra to. I've, I've been to places where, you know, these current riots in, in Sweden, where I spoke to, to some of the guys that were involved and they said, well, we were paid by the local newspaper, not the local newspaper. It's uh, like uh, uh, the it's a national newspaper, but sort of like the ones you buy in the evening, the Evening Post type of not very high quality. There are two big ones in Sweden. They paid them to turn some cars on fire so that they could get some good fo footage. There were no riots at all. There were some burning cars, but then it was pumped out in the media. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! And this is, I would very much suggest, like, whenever these things, when you read about these things and so on, ask yourself, who benefits from me believing this? Who benefits from me becoming fearful? Because you will see between the lines, it's always a matter of something fearful, something that would scare you. I'm loving this conversation because it's going to be food for thought for a lot of folks that are even in the alternative media that have uh, really jumped on board the whole refugee crisis issue. And and I'm saying if, folks, if what Oli is saying is correct, that the numbers and the scenarios, the uh, the rioting and all that, if, if it's not at the level that's being, that's being broadcasted out to the public, or maybe not even happening at all, perhaps maybe some of this stuff or a lot of this stuff is a PSYOP, a false flag type of uh, setup, then there's a lot of people in the alternative media and the truth movement that are being deceived also, because there's a lot of people who are believing these stories that are coming out about these refugees out in Europe. I mean, to a certain degree, I could say probably even myself that I know about these things, and I'll put some of these articles up on the blog. So I'm going to have to take a step back and pause and evaluate this stuff a little better. A real journalist goes on location and finds out what's going on. All the rest of us are guessing. This is why I always try, if possible, if I got the financial means, to go on location right when these operations are taking place and see what is going on, what actually happened and so on. Because otherwise we can just guess, you know, and that is not, <clears throat> but Real journalism is finding out the real truth, I would say. And here, yeah. when I think it's really a good point you made that also maybe, you know, you by spreading these articles, maybe you're playing their hand, you know. And this is not something we want to do. I mean, I know you have a massive big heart. That's the last thing you want to do. Yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time on it as far as articles go. I mean, every once in a while, I'll post, I'll, I'll post something that's related to it. I haven't been, you know, chasing it and tracking it, you know, fervently. But my point being is that there are a lot of what I consider to be good people with good alternative media outlets that have been. And your point is right on the money, which is that maybe they're playing into their into their hands. They're playing their game. They're helping them to uh, propagate this lie. Have you noticed like um, from time to time, you know, the so-called alternative media, we who are so awake and then everything we're so liberal and so loving and then something happens and boom, the door just slams, you know, right in our face where massive di di diversion, no, division inside the movement and, and people are pointing fingers or people are totally buying into the fear. I think what was it with the Ebola 
uh, where people freaked out instead of seeing, listen, it's another one. It's just another one. It's an updated swine flu owned by the CDC. They have the patents. They are doing the whole thing. It is the exact same thing, version two, upgraded to 0.3, whatever, you know, same story again. And then suddenly, ah, yeah. and then it turned out absolutely zero people died of Ebola. Next time something like that happened, I would suggest we should be more aware and say, hang on, before I buy this, before it's the upside down blown up donkey virus, uh, I'm going to take a step back and just see is it the exact same theme being pay- played out? Is it this, wh- who owns the patent? Is there actually a patent on this disease that, I mean, where did that come from? And especially if it's like from 1947, like with the Ebola virus or the Zika virus, right. you can buy the Zika virus online, you know, these type of things don't buy into it. And then look at, What's being played? Look at it as a theater. What is going on? Don't get emotionally involved, but take a step back and see, am I, what am I part of creating? I, I can personally say if I was part of creating more fear, I would shut up and go to bed and pull the blanket over my head and not say another word, you know, because then I would totally be playing their game. And I, that is my the exact the last thing I ever want to do, because I want all of us to be free and be liberated from this crap, you know. So I'm trying to decode what is being thrown at us, to debunk what is when these attacks are not even real. I do everything I can to point out things so that you can see for yourself. I mean, the truck could not even go there if it. If he had tried, you know, it is an impos- impossibility to pass over these metal boulders with a truck without massive damage to the truck. And there is no massive damage to the truck. And that is just one out of so, so, so many details that I can just keep on. And I would love if I can just point out a few more things when it comes to the building. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember a guy called Richard Goodyear? When the Nice attack happened, it was being filmed uh, from a balcony of the Westminster Hotel by a tourist that filmed the truck. For some reason, he was filming the truck before anything happened, which you do when you're on holiday. Not. Okay. So he was filming this truck, and then suddenly it accelerated, and you you saw it. You never saw it hit anyone, but it looked like it was taking, uh, you know, taking off into the crowd. Later turned out that the hotel that we identified is only like 215 yards from the uh, casino where the shootout with the police was. The official story says 1.2 mile. We say 215 yards, which is a very perfect small little area that you can control without a lot of people seeing what's actually going on. Anyway, so who I'm always so curious, who did the filming? At the Charlie Hebdo attack, uh, when the police was shot on the pavement, do you remember these two? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. The guy, was that a Parisian guy who was just uh, having, he was just down getting some garlic and a baguette, and then he was he came home to his apartment and uh, wanted to see some French TV. Was that who, who filmed it? No, it was the uh, chief, no, the uh, second second in charge editor of the second biggest Israeli TV channel who was there filming the whole thing. Okay. That's a bit of a coincidence. That's a red flag. That's a red flag <laughs> if you ever see one, especially since the guy who was shot li- lives. He's doing fine. He lives in Buenos Aires, and he's an Israeli Mossad agent. He's doing fine. He was paid $666,000, according to insiders, and he's been given six years to stay down in Buenos Aires until things has cooled down. And then after a plastic operation, he's welcome back. Okay. So then we go to Nice. Who filmed there? Well, it was a German guy called Richard Gutjahr. And Richard Gutjahr, we have media here again, is an internet sensation as a journalist, internet journalist. And for some bizarre reason, he was also the world's first owner of an iPad. I don't know if that means anything, but he was 
the first one in the line of thousands of people who got in and, and came out was filmed with an iPad. Anyway, he was the one filming it. So who is Richard Goodyear? We started looking into his family and friends and so on. Turns out that his wife, Einheit Wilf, is hold your horses. He, he is, she was the advisor for Shimon Peres, the prime minister of Israel. She was a member of the Israeli Knesset, the government in, in Israel. And in her military service, she worked in a unit 8802, I believe, very closely connected to Mossad. Okay, so that is like a massive big red flag, I would say. So I found some clues. I thought the next attack would be in Acropolis in Greece. It turned out it was the Olympia, but not Olympia in Greece. It was the Olympia supermarket in München. So who was there? Well, guess who? Richard Goodyear again. And who? one was one of the star witnesses that was being interviewed by international media. His daughter, Tamina Stahl. Stahl. Okay, so now we go forward uh, to Berlin. Not Richard Goodyear again. I mean, really? No, not at all. Instead, on location, just a few minutes before the truck arrived, you had uh, Shlomo Shapiro, who is the terror expert in Israel. He's a, a lecturer at the uh, university in Tel Aviv. He was there on location at the Christmas market, leaving just a few minutes before. So he was on a bus, and when he heard the sirens coming, and then he came to the hotel room, the phones were ringing. He was being called to, to the TV studios. So he gave lots of interviews. What are the chances that the number one terror expert for Israel, indirectly Mossad, was on location? And who was his colleague, is his colleague at the university? Einat Wilf, the, the wife of Richard Goodyear. And also, I have a photo of his daughter, Richard Goodyear's daughter, Tamina Stahl, together with Hillary Clinton, just a, a month or so before. It's unbelievable. It's, you know, the Israelis, the Zionists, the Mossad, they have got their hands into this stuff so deep, so deep. And what's really interesting about it, Oli, is aside from shows like this, nobody really ever talks about it. They just don't talk about it. You're not allowed to talk about it. As soon as you point at Israel, they say anti-Semite. This has nothing to do with anti-Semite or anything like that. It is a matter of tracking down criminals. And I, I, I read a it's quote. It's connecting the dots. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't care who, if you're Jew, if you're Hindu, if you're Sikh, if you're red, blue, green, I don't care. I track down bad guys. And they say, I, I read just a few hours ago, they said, uh, Researching state fabricated terrorism without looking at Mossad is like watching Hamlet without the prince. Oh, exactly. They are the ones who invented this whole thing. And then CIA came in and just like, yeah, this is a great idea. So they started with a strategy of tension, involved the whole Gladio network and then Operation Chaos. This whole thing. It is, a, it is the same, the same. How to control us. How can the few there in the thousands control us in the billions only through crap like this? So the only thing is for us to debunk it saying, listen, nothing actually happened. There's no reason for you to be afraid. There's no reason for you to be afraid. And then take your power back and say, thank you. Just like with the opt in and opt out with these body scanners, take the power back and say, Thank you. It's very kind of you, but no, thank you. I will step aside and walk my own way. Stop watching their media because their media is is the way that these these this small minority becomes larger than life because they they project all this stuff into your living room and then into your minds. So people really have to shut it down. People have to they have to find the truth, and by doing that, you have to spread your wings and you have to go to alternative sites, alternative research, and um, those types of avenues. But, um, you know, only I didn't mean to interrupt you there for a moment, but I'm still seeing, even within, you know, people I know, where they are still glued 
to that television set. They're still glued to the media and they're still absorbing this stuff. You know, it, it's just amazing to me that um, sometimes I wonder, not to sound like a Debbie Downer here, folks, but sometimes I wonder if like we're just shoveling against the tide sometimes, you know, because when I talk to you, I feel good. When I talk to Sophia, I feel good, you know? <laughs> then I go and I go talk to my, you know, people I know on the outside, and it's not such a good feeling because many times, um, I had a situation, in fact, this past weekend with some family members, and uh, we got into a uh, discussion on a topic, not this in particular, but it had to do with alternative research, alternative thoughts and ideas, and they lost their minds. They absolutely lost their minds. It was just something that, cut across the grain. They just couldn't deal with it in their paradigm. You know, they have this established paradigm and they only want to understand the world through that lens. And that is it. Don't tell me there's another lens because I don't want to see through it. I don't want to know about it. But my point being is, is that, you know, we talk about this stuff and one of the things that people have to do is they have to just shut the vehicles off, the apparatus off that is infecting them. It's like a mind parasite that they're being infected with. Then what, what you're doing is basically you become an enabler of their agenda because you're playing into their game. My, my, my friends and families are the toughest ones. I call it boot camp. You know, <laughs> and I avoid it. I avoid it. I avoid it. I don't speak to anyone who's not opening up the door. I mean, for me, it's strange that here I live in Spain. Nobody talks to me about these things, even though internationally I'm looked upon as, as somebody worth An listening expert. to. Yeah. And, and no, more or less none of my friends here ask me, or it's like, uh, you know, there's not a question. There's not nothing. I, I go somewhere in the world. I do. I try to do my best. I come home. Not even a question. Where have you been? How are you doing? You know? and, <laughs> You're making but, me feel better. <laughs> I get the no, same but thing. It's like, I, for me, it's just like, okay, fair enough. And yeah. I, the way I see it is just that it's very painful to wake up, especially what I've noticed is the less you know, the more you will fight for you being right. Mm -hmm. you, you know, people who are starting to see, oh, God, I have no clue. They're more open to to see that things might not be the way they thought it was. But... Uh, and also, we've been so pumped with, well, if I'm an, an adult and I'm a responsible adult, I need to keep myself informed about what's going on. I totally agree. But then please be aware of who's the owner of, of these, uh, you know, channels that you're using. Who, I mean, like CNN, BBC, I don't trust them as far as I can spit, you know. And, but, also, you need to be very aware of also in the alternative media, we have, there are lots of infiltrators and, and uh, things that are there to divert your attention away from what's actually go. And also where they're pumping out like 80% truth saying you can really trust me and then 20% absolute lies to yeah. keep you. But then you believe this individual. I mean, there's one of the so-called big uh, Big people on the internet and this uh, thing that is totally not trustworthy. Uh, and, uh, but it shows itself over, over time. And you will also see more and more how they play into this agenda and how they play more and more pointing towards races and, and when things are obviously staged events. I mean, I'm not talking about jumping into conclusion, but once you really start looking into some of these, I mean, they're not very well pulled off. These are not high, yeah. high level skilled operations, many of them. So people in, in those positions in alternative media should not be a stranger to seeing the signs, seeing the whole setup, you know, seeing the, with the crisis actors, the fake this, the fake that. But here they are pumping out the official story, pumping out. So I'm like, whoa, who are you? You know? Who You're talking are you? about it, like uh, an outlet like Infowars. I'm talking about Alex Jones, yeah. yeah I'm talking Alex, about yeah. uh, Noam Chomsky uh, and so on, where people it's it's just mind blowing. Like Noam Chomsky, who's been pumping out so much incredible information from so many years. Then we come to 9/11, boom, door closed. Right. It's the right. official story. Yeah, InfoWars is very interesting that way, and I agree with you 100% because with InfoWars, you can get maybe 
70 percent of what InfoWars is pumping out there uh, can be looked, in my view, looked upon as being truthful. But there's this other 25 to 30 percent, like you say, Oli, where they are pushing an agenda. I'm sorry to say, but that that is what I've discovered. I mean, I spoke uh, to Alex Jones 2009, and I I used to really look up to him, and I met the Infowars uh, reporters from them at the Bilderberg meeting in Copenhagen. I've seen meet, met them other places, but it's just like, what the hell is going on, you know? And then you see also what is the message that is being spread out there, yeah. the end game. Fear, fear, fear. We're screwed. It's going down. We have no power. We're being so, there's surveillance everywhere. You have no control over your life. There's no personal power, no freedoms left. And then with this voice, you know, it's like, uh, and also at these meetings where there's a peace gathering against a very dark force. And then within minutes when he arrives, it's like lynch mob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, almost he almost ap operates. Alex Jones does sometimes as an agent provocateur. Yeah, I totally agree. When these uh, you know when these events take place, so uh, it's it's interesting. You know, I I basically when I first started getting into the research, I used to watch and read a lot of what was going on in the you know in the alternative world by going to Infowars, and I found that um, I outgrew it. A, a long time ago. Like I said, every once in a while with the blog, I will scour articles. And if I find something that's interesting and I, and I, I deem that the article is, is worthy or trustworthy enough to put up on my own blog, I'll do that. But I find myself having, uh, pulled away from them in a big, big way. And not just them. I'm talking about other alternative research and truth types of, um, channels on YouTube as an example or blogs where in the beginning, I found the information interesting. Uh, it pulled me in to do my own research. But after I did more and more of my own research and I connected into better resources, better information, I find myself not really going there anymore. So I hate to dump on InfoWars, but I'm just letting folks know, you know, where I landed with it, where I'm at with it today. It's basically, in my view, to crapshoot these days. It's just like you say, I'm not here to, to yeah. criticize anyone. I'm just observing and yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a very sad, sad picture that appears after a while. But this is also when you see how do you hijack, uh, populations? How do you hijack opinions? And this is by you enter in like a hero on stage. You know, it's a one man single, you know, like standing up against the dark forces. And then you deliver a lot of incredible information. And then over time, when you start getting a lot of followers, that is when you start diverting into the real agenda. Because then you got the followers and then people follow, no disrespect, but more like sheep, you know, not really understanding that they're being led in a different direction. Yeah. Which I find this is where you have to be very, very aware. And, uh, and I'm being warned about Everyone. I haven't been warned about you, but you're more or less the only one, but everything else. And I, I'm in a, in, I mean, I'm surrounded by former CIA, Pentagon, uh, you know, some, I met spies, I met military intelligence, fake journalists, real journalists. I have no idea, you know, I'm just wandering around totally naive, thinking the best of people at the same time, trying to be streetwise enough not to get bumped off. And I tell you, I have to, I have to tell you, I just went to England and, uh, I just went for four days, three different, uh, talks in four days, very intense. And I had no idea who the groups were. I, the thing is, I will go and talk to anyone anywhere as long as they don't try to, to censor me, you know, so I don't care. Hell's Angels, fine. Gang wars, middle of that. I'm no problem. I'll go there. Military police, I'll go there. And here I came to, uh, we were informed um, about the meeting just two hours before it took place. So I thought, why this security type of thing? Is it? I thought it was ridiculous. It was because of me, because uh, I, I hadn't made a secret of me coming or whatever. So 
Anyway, two two hours before we came to the Holiday Inn Hotel, which is a sort of like quite a posh hotel in in the center of London, and the crowd was very much, uh, I would say, right wing, uh, older men, many of them right wing. It, I've never been in in such a crowd before. There was also National Front, you know, skinheads with the flags and all of these things, and I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Really good that I didn't know about it because maybe I would have chickened out or, or stepped away, you know, because I thought this is going to be perfect. Uh, total no, no control whatsoever what's going to happen. And then while we were in there, on the outside of the hotel, we started hearing, whoa, 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 whoa. I looked out the window and there was about 50, 60, you can see it on YouTube, people in black masks and black uh, flags and a smoke bomb outside. Police arrived, there were police helicopters, uh, and uh, so I thought, you know, I, I, when it was my turn, there was there were 10 speakers, uh, I was one of them, and I was standing there with banners on the side, I think one of them was the so-called EDL, and the other one was National Front, I believe, yeah. and I was in the middle, so I thought, great that this is going to be filmed, because I don't want to get ambushed afterwards saying, well, you spoke in front of this group. And since I knew that this uh, group was not very fond of uh, people from other race or color, uh, I spoke about my trip to Iran uh, and uh, the incredible things I experienced down there, how I uh, helped to smuggle people out there in the end and, and so on. And afterwards, uh, because I came with the intention of love, compassion, forgiveness, and let's heal this whole place. And after the, when I finished my speech, there were two people that came up, one of them crying afterwards, you know, because, uh, and this is what I love about these things. When you come from the heart, when you get your ego out of the way and just speak from your soul, uh, like that, <laughs> <laughs> you, you reach the heart of other people. It doesn't matter what uh, group or race or, or political view or, in my opinion, if you come from the heart, if the the uh, the heart of the other one is not too cemented, there might be a crack, and you can you can right. meet that way. And it's just beautiful when it happens. Now, only when um, you said that um, you've been warned about folks in the alternative research. You don't have to mention names, but I'm just curious: are they names that surprised you? In other words, and they said you know you shouldn't trust that person, and you thought to yourself, well, you know, I don't know about that because. I find that person sincere and I think they're genuine. I think they have their heart in the right place. Has anything surprised you as far as being warned about people that you trusted? Yeah, I still trust them. I still trust them. I've been warned, I don't know how many times about Jim Fetzer. I've been warned uh, about Chris Boleyn. I've been warned about, I mean, so, so many. You know, you shouldn't trust him. You shouldn't trust him. But I, I know with Fetzer that... Uh, we, we we had a death threat, the two of us, at the same time. I've seen him, you know, like uh, not totally in balance, uh, you know, because it's hard on the family. It's hard on, on everything, relationships, when in a situation like that. And he handled himself beautiful, I tell you. Uh, and And he's, you know, his family around him and friends, not easy for him either. You know, it might look so, but it's not. And especially when there's a threat against the family, that is that is heavy duty. And uh, so I do not care what other people say. Uh, I listen and I totally do not listen. Yeah, because I hear that stuff too. I, I hear people tell me, you, know, you shouldn't trust that person, don't trust that guy over there, that gal over here, you know. And I'm thinking, first of all, what I do is I have to go with my own intuition, right? And if I have a connection with somebody and I feel like that person is, uh, I have a sense that they're genuine and they're real, then, you know, we're going to have a very good conversation, a good friendship, whatever. I, I think that there are people out there that are spreading those types of things. Not to say that there aren't people out there that who aren't operatives in the alternative research. There definitely are. Um, but there are also a lot of really good people. And I think there's other people who are operatives who are trying to really stir the pot to just to create a total environment or atmosphere of distrust all over, all over, you know? It's like if I'm talking to Oli, it's like he, they want to put in Mike's mind is, 
is, is Oli real or is Oli, you know, or if you're talking to me, it's like, is Mike real or is Mike, you know, some kind of psyop? It's, it's really strange the way the whole thing works. I just real quick, I don't mean to take up much of your time here, but I had somebody tell me uh, a good a person I had on the show was told by somebody that I was taking money. So, uh, and I, and I know this person really well. So he called me and he spoke to me about it. And I said, well, look, you go back to that person and ask them where they mailed the check to because I didn't get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they put the wrong address on the envelope. But it's, it's those types of things that go out there. It's blatantly false. It's a blatant lie. And just so, and not only you and I have talked about this before in other shows. I don't get paid to do any of this stuff. My YouTube channel is not monetized. Everything that I do here when I talk to my guests is all on my nickel. And this is not a rewarding type of activity or you know, type of uh, job, if you will, because there's, there's no money in it. There's no money in it. For those people that are really in it for the right reasons, it's like, it's zero, it's zero. So anyway, I just wanted to get that out there because it goes along with what you what you were saying before about trusting, not trusting, who's who's genuine, who's not genuine, and uh, it gets very convoluted. I just know that there's one person I can trust, hopefully, myself, and that's it. Mm -hmm. that's and then right. I trust myself, my gut feeling, because also it, it is a minefield because uh, – I know that sometimes I'm threading uh, in areas where it's not very popular and uh, people have a tendency to die quite young if you if you don't move forward with uh, precaution, you know. So it's uh so I just try to keep my naivety because I want to feel I want to trust people. I want to see the good in people. At the same time, not be stupid, uh, and and I hope I'm street smart enough to see the signs. I know that I've been betrayed a few times, very very painful because I I had no idea. I but afterwards, afterwards once I started seeing uh, understanding that it had actually happened, I I noticed that there were signs that I neglected that I mm -hmm. you know I I saw them but I didn't really. Pay attention. I just no, no, no. I shouldn't yeah. think. I, but the signs were there, at least with one of them. Uh, so I, I try to move forward with that. Also, one thing I, I want to say: this whole thing um, with money is a tricky one because, I mean, I've I spent some thirty years uh, doing this, and the last four years, three four years, I've been this doing this nonstop. And the thing, I've got a family to feed, so no money, what, how are you supposed to do that? Right. And what I meant only was that, that you, I didn't mean to say that we shouldn't make money at this. What I'm saying is this is not a lucrative endeavor. It is that, not. That's, that's my point. Now, many times I have thought about, should I, as an example, monetize my YouTube channel? Because you're doing all this work. You're doing the interviews, you're setting them up, you're doing all the editing, you're doing all the graphics, you're putting all that stuff together. And there's a mindset out there that says, well, if you consider being compensated for that in any way, you're a sellout. Well, I know. No. How am I a sellout? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm doing all this work to get the word out. And like in your case, you have a family, you got to put food on the table, you, you've got to make ends meet. So, you know, my point being was that is that we're not getting rich at this is what I'm saying. That, that that was my point. Not that we shouldn't make money at it. I think if you can make money at it, you make a couple of bucks, you can support your family doing this, and you're getting the truth out there, then God bless you. Godspeed. Do it. But it's not a, uh, a get-rich scheme. It's not something that you're going to be, you know, just rolling around in money. That's just not just not how it works. Uh, I haven't found the, the magic way yet, so that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is also people say, well, he's only doing it to sell sell books, but I mean, how many books? It's like a handful here and there, and uh, and I mean, I don't know. I think I've done, I don't know, five hundred, a thousand interviews, something like that. I have not been paid once. I go to conferences, yeah. What do they, they pay? The flight, the accommodation, and the food. That's mm -hmm. it, you know. So I often have like a, a what do you call it? A piggy piggy bank. 
a piggy bag, you know, where people can don't put donation in so that I have something to bring home because I yeah. feel very bad coming home if I, if I cannot uh, bring something home to my family. That's my concern, you know, and, and also I think it's, it's ridiculous, you know, like if you look at something, somebody like David Icke, I believe that uh, this is a person who has done more good for humanity than, well, very few other people, uh, reptilians and so aside that is one thing but my god has he shown us uh, a lot of of the truth about what's going on and well, he's right about pedophilia yeah he's right about so so many things yeah. and if he can do a world tour if he can fill uh wembley stadium or wh whatever it is my god bless him and let him have some benefits in life as well you know instead of he's earning money and then that should be held against him yeah, they don't hold it against Hillary Clinton or Bill Gates or anybody who goes and does an event or does a speech and gets paid tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's not an issue. But if David Icke puts on an event and he sells tickets and gets paid, that's a big problem. I don't get I mean, it. I don't get it either. I don't, I don't get, it. get it. And I think, my God, he, if anyone, should be rewarded. He should not... The way I see it, he should not have to worry about money at all. Let him do his thing. I feel the same way as well. You know, I feel I shouldn't have to worry about money as well. Let me focus on my part. For some strange reason, I am in this situation now where this body setup that I am walking around in is super good at finding out and spotting these things and stopping them. You know, you put me in the kitchen, I'm a total disaster. You put me in front of whatever, I, I'm worthless. Here, I am the thing. And for some reason, my brain is good at this. Then let me do it, because it's hurting all of us. So why not just get my butt on a plane, if there's one of these things, get me over there and let me stop it, instead of... No, you shouldn't, you shouldn't ask for donations. You shouldn't do that because that is ugly. I mean, for crying out loud, I don't, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. Well, if you want somebody to do the work, if you want somebody to do the research, if you want somebody to do the investigating and you are not going to do it yourself, then they should donate the money to somebody like yourself to be able to go do the research and the investigations that have, to, that have to happen in order for us to, to, you know, to get the truth out. So I agree, Oli. It's it's kind of this really weird psychology that takes place, and uh, I, I, I don't get it. I really don't. Do you know, like, I, I think, like, if I was focusing on, like, let's have a lynch meeting and, and chop the head of the elite or something like that, and let me get finances to go and, and kill these people, I wouldn't support that either. But what is it, what is the whole thing about? You would get a lot of money for that, though. <laughs> I would. Yeah, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but um, anyway, 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 I, I derailed you there. So we were talking about the uh, we were talking about the false flags, and then before we got started with the show, you had mentioned to me, you said Mike, that uh, there was some kind of clue as to maybe perhaps the next the next one. Is that what you were alluding to? Yeah, I can I can say like this. I I said um, in. Please keep aware uh, these NATO countries. So just because it's different countries does not mean that they're not connected. I would strongly suggest they are just like a global tour, like a rock group on a global tour. So there was a, a police shooting in mid December in Denmark, uh, of a police officer. This is very, very unusual in, in Denmark or has been up until recent years, you know, where they said that this police officer, somebody just walked up and shot him in the street. Okay, his his last name was Yule, which, which means Christmas. Then uh, I think even his first name was Christian Yule, which means Christian Christmas. Okay, maybe a coincidence, but please hear me out because I would say that we're looking upon a psyop here as well in the background. Okay, then you have the first images of this whole thing coming out from Berlin, where the truck the truck was dark blue or black and the the trailer behind it was silver color but the the images that was being pumped out this whole thing was golden gold is also one of these colors that keeps repeating with all the victims with these golden 
blankets, uh, gold blankets, you know, heating blankets. The gold color keeps also dead bodies are being covered with these gold blankets. Gold is something that keeps repeating for some reason I'm not totally sure about. And anyway, there's this guy that looks like he's from the forensic team that looks like Santa Claus. He's walking straight across. And also there's, it looks like a ribbon almost around, uh, this truck. You know, the whole setting up, setup is Christmas. There's a Christmas tree. There's stars in the background. There's stars on the street. All of it like terror for Christmas. Uh, you know, and Rudolph with the red nose, these type of things. So that happened. <clears throat> then straight after that, uh, we had a night, nightclub shooting in Istanbul. And in Istanbul, it was said that, uh, the guy who did the shooting was dressed in a Christmas, uh, you no, know, Santa Claus outfit. When you look at the, the footage, he was absolutely not dressed like that, but that was what was being, being pumped out. And even the prime minister went out afterwards and, and denied it, saying he was not dressed in a Santa Claus uh, outfit. But once again, with a psyop, it doesn't matter if you say he was or he wasn't. In your head, you hear it. You yeah. Know? Don't drink Coca-Cola. You hear Coca-Cola. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then you have, it turns out that the Russian, uh, no, sorry, the the Turkish police actually had an undercover operation going on with uh, their police uh, 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 units in Santa Claus outfits, okay? Also, you will see that outside the club uh, where this night, uh, this shooting took place, there was a big, big banner where there's a guy in a big beard, I don't know who it is, is just punching Santa right in the face, okay? Then you had... Um, the Fort Lauderdale shooting, absolute hoax once again. You you look into the details. It's yep. not it was a hoax. good. Yep. Not good, folks. Not, not good. Uh, and then in the background or on several different locations, there's this bizarre figure called uh, Santa, Santa Paul, who is dressed in a neon green uh, like T-shirt. And bright red trousers, these type of, uh, I don't know what you call them. Suspenders, yeah. Yeah, Overalls. suspenders. And then with a yep. big white beard, glasses, and a, it looks like a tinfoil hat on it. And the images, when you take them frame by frame, you will see that they're totally manipulated. They look really weird. And on some of it, it looks like they put a Santa mask on him. You know, he's also being interviewed. And he's in different uh, locations, both the arrival and departure. And he's there really late at night with a massive big dog uh, and so on. So uh, when you look at these clues about the next upcoming, when he, when this guy de- uh, appeared like Santa, Santa Paul, I thought, is it St. Paul? You got St. Paul in, in Mississippi, haven't you? Or, or is yeah. It, yeah. So in, I uh, thought St. Paul, Minneapolis. St. Paul, Minneapolis, or St. Paul uh, in London. But then the Melbourne thing happened. Did you hear about the Melbourne thing where a guy... With the, uh, with the car? With the car, doing donuts, round, 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 and then it said he just headed right in, inside yep. the crowd and killed a lot of people and so on. And when you look at it, I mean, <clears throat> once again, I looked very deep into it. <clears throat> it turns out that... It's when you look at the whole place where it's it's taking uh, where it's happening. It's out, outside the Flinders station, which is a symbol, an icon of Melbourne in the background of the, all this footage. Uh, you will see also on one of the walls when he do the donuts, there's like this <clears throat> this uh, face. It's big like a wall painting with like staring almost like uh, zombie eyes, totally dead eyes, but shining eyes, where it says ready on it with like a pyramid shape in the middle. The A is like a pyramid shape. The whole th- setup is, um, you will see that there are three um, private police cars, still identical. There's a, a white, um, uh, like a, what do you call it? Like an Audi station wagon type of thing. There's also two trams that are blocking the street. So what looks like a very busy intersection is not busy at all. It is 
being blocked by a few vehicles. And then there's one guy directing him. He's dressed in blue. One guy directing him, go around, round, and do more of this, do more of that, and pointing and so on. And you got like these bouncers again. They're dressed, uh, several of them have Nike t-shirts, big guys, you know, uh, bouncers. And also you got several police officers doing absolutely nothing to interfere the whole thing. Then when he gets direction and drives off, these cars follow him, the three silver cars and the the big white one. They just follow him very close, no sirens, no nothing, not trying to interfere. You will also see that he goes in under in areas where there's, uh, it's not scaffolding, but they're sort of like built in things with the big uh, metal bars. And I would very much say that here we are again looking at uh, constricted areas, you know, where it's easy to keep people out. You know, yeah. this is not a place that you easily get access to from the outside. So the only thing you need once again is like 30, 30, 40 people, maybe the same people from Berlin who's just now in Melbourne, uh, who see, who looks like they're jumping to the sides. You see the car, he's driving with flashlights on, all hazard lights on all the time, braking lights instead of just going full speed ahead trying to hit the car. And also there's <clears throat> on the car doing the, the donuts. There's, uh, what do you call it? A tow hitch. Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah. But then the car where he's being pulled out, they say it's the old, old, you know, like messed up the car where they say all the bodies were bouncing off it. Uh, that one does not have a tow hitch. Then when we started pointing this out, three days later, a video appeared where the car, uh, from a new video that I've never seen from a different angle, where there is a tow hitch on that car. I would very much say that it's an after construction that they've added that. You would also see how he's pulled out of the car and they dragged across the pavement. He's been shot, they say, the asylum, uh, dragged across the pavement uh, with his head bouncing in the pavement like this, very fast, like this. Absolutely not a real body, I would suggest. And also... Uh, he was stopped at the, um, um, I think it's called Bolton Street 555, but it said that he hit a, um, a pram, no, yeah, a pram, um, a woman with a pram, uh, the same street, but 110, that is like four blocks away, and still you will see on the hood of the car is part of this pram, after 400 meters just lying loose on top, I would say absolutely not, part of the whole set up. But what I wanted to point out as a possibility, possible next target is that this Melbourne station where this whole thing took place, I think it's uh, Flinders uh, train station. It is a very big, iconic, beautiful old building. And in the, the, uh, what you saw, the back part or the, the part furthest away, there's a tower that is almost identical to Big Ben in London. And when the footage starts, uh, because once again, please be aware of these things. When the footage starts before there's actually any action, be aware of that. And here you have footage where the, the whole intersection is more or less empty. And you can see that tower in the center of the image. And then they zoom in and in comes the car and starts doing the donuts. So I would say in this program, it's good to say, uh, to point it out now. It's the, it's February the 21st. Should there be a hit against the uh, Big Ben, then let it be known that this was pointed out beforehand. Okay. Or something that happens in London, I guess. I mean, you know, um, true. You're saying specifically Big Ben. I'm, I'm just saying that the tower of that train station where the camera is focused on it right before it actually has start, it's like we're back to the psyop again. The first few seconds where your mind is just like, what's going to happen? You're looking straight at that tower and then boom comes the donuts and everything that distracts your mind and, and so on. And, but these are the things where I, from experience, go like, whoa, 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 hang on, what's that? And I, I just want to say that uh, uh, right across that train station is the St. Paul's Cathedral. Ah, uh, okay. 
Do you okay. see what I'm saying? Saint I see what Paul you're saying, yeah. And St. Paul's Cathedral. I don't think anyone has ever pointed that one out, uh, but it's right opposite. So if you look Google Map, you've got the train station on one side of the crossing. You look across the crossing, uh, the intersection, you got St. Paul's Cathedral. Really you know, dark. It looks quite demonic, this this uh, cathedral, you know, this like, whoa, that type of feeling. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're dropping clues <clears throat> like like you have shown so many times before, Oli, that this is what they like to do. You know, it's like a it's almost like a big game to them. Um, you know, here's another clue for you all and uh, see who picks up on it. You know, um, it's very twisted, very twisted. But they do this with the, the names also when you uh, when you see the people being interviewed like Harry Fear or uh, Annie Cattle or. I, I tell you, the other one, I saw a, a surname from the Melbourne attack, Dick on Ass. Is that a, I mean, really? <laughs> Is that a surname? <laughs> I was like, what? And then the guy that they, they blamed the whole thing, I think his name is Dimitris, and then almost Gorgonzolas, so that you will remember his name, you know, they say he was an, an a Greek emigrant uh, type, but Garga, it's Gargan soulless, soulless, uh, you know. Soulless, okay. Yes, soulless. But so that you, Gorgan Sola, so you remember it. Do you know at the Copenhagen shooting, there was a Jewish guy, they said, uh, was shot dead. Um, he was, I mean, he was like uh, 34 or 37 years old, unmarried, uh, no job. He was a basketball player, you know. That is normally called a loser, I would say, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he was named right away Man of the Year. Man of the Year. Okay. How? And it wasn't that he did some heroic thing. This guy is said to have been acting like he was drunk. The guard uh, was just standing there, and this guy just suddenly pulled a gun and gave, and gave him a headshot. Boom. So there was no heroic. He just, the only thing he did was officially died. And then man of the year. His name was Dan Uzan, like U-Z-A-N, okay, which right away, in my mind, goes like Uzi, you know, the only, th uh, like Dan Uzi. A weapon, a gun, yeah. Yeah, but also Usan in Danish, if you spell it in a different way, but the exact same pronunciation means not true, untrue. Dan, oh, true. okay, okay. So, uh, do you know, I, I even, you know, I question many of these identities because they're just phantom identities. Well, they'd have, they'd have to be. I mean, because, um, if the whole thing is staged, then these people are actors and actresses and, you know, they're not going to step up to the plate with real names and real identities. I tell you, I have been on location on so many, I think about 10 different where location in Europe where the, and in the US where these, uh, so-called terror attacks have happened. I have not managed to find, I found a couple of graves in total, two, but no death certificate, no birth certificates. When you go to the school, they say, no, he would not hear. Uh, he must have been, there's a confusion or misunderstanding. Not there, not here. Do you know, like with the Lee Rigby beheading in London, just be, this is the thing also, every time, Every year, just before the Bilderberg meeting, which is, is the first weekend of June, or one of the first days in June, uh, there's always a some kind of diversion attack going on, so that instead of focusing on that meeting, suddenly, whoa, we will look over here. And there was this, this was in 2013, just a week or so before the Bilderberg meeting uh, in Woodford, outside London. Then there are these two black uh, guys who said to have chopped the head of an English soldier. Okay. The thing is, uh, my friend, uh, the researcher Nick Collistrom, um, he, he sent in, you know, to the name and register office saying, please send me the birth certificate and death certificate of the soldier, Lee Rigby. He got his money back a few weeks later saying, sorry, there's no such person. You know, some of the victims from the Bataclan, he did the same thing there, got the money back saying, sorry, there's no such person, you know. There's like this, the marriage certificate doesn't match up, you know, it's signed by the wrong person. 
It's not his father's name. It's his stepfather's name. Uh, Rigby, why did they, you know, he's lying there. I would say, it, did they, is that part of the psyop? Eleanor Rigby, who died alone and it was so sad and nobody was there, you know, and he was a fus fusilier. Is that because of the baby boy, Jesus, what the drummer boy, that song, you know, to put it into the psyop? They, they put it, all of these things in, as ingredients playing us, playing us, I would say. You have to ask yourself, so why do they do it? Maybe they do it because they get their rocks off by doing it. And also maybe because there are people out there that are looking into the stuff like yourself and others. And it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a wink and a nod. Uh, yeah, you know, you may have figured it out or you're figuring it out, but They'll never solve the puzzle from a broad perspective because there's too many people walking around like sheep, you know, that just don't pay attention. So I, I don't know. I, you know, it's interesting that they put all this stuff in there. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to understand, I guess, their motive for, for putting this stuff into these, these events where you, as an example, identify this stuff. But, you know, why is it in there? Is it in there because they have to, in their minds, maybe like you've mentioned in previous shows from a karma perspective, they have to do that or is it more like we want to do it you know it's uh from a very sick twisted perspective we think it's fun i don't know i i believe it's a combination it's i mean dick on ass i mean really yeah please harry yeah. harry fear annie cattle i've got some other ones where it's like uh, uh there was somebody called dennis almost brain dead I mean, the the name was so close to brain dead. <laughs> and, do you know, these type of things where you can wow. see somebody's having fun here. You know? Yeah. And and when I spoke to Chip, he said, but, you know, like, you're making such a fuss of these things. It's too much. It's like for these people, just another day at the office. You know, it's just their job with marketing, you know, like slogans like Charlie Hep, um, Je suis Charlie. I mean, that is not somebody, some, something... That is not something somebody just comes up with. It's a slogan. It's a marketing slogan with a whole f logo, with the fonts and black background, white, in the thousands pre-printed so that it was just handed out. Just like thousands of candles was handed out in Copenhagen after the shooting there so that the demonstrations looked really good, you know, and so on. It's marketing campaigns and people are being paid lots and for them, it's just another day. They are being played as well. This is the whole thing. Does Chip ever give a perspective on whether all the work that folks like yourself are doing is... Making a difference. Making a difference or going to have an impact? I mean, does he ever give you his perspective on whether that day is ever going to happen where, you know, basically the ship turns? Or, or is Chip's perspective on this thing, you know? It's the way it works. It's the way of the world. It's always going to be like that. Um, I mean, what, what does he say about that? I think I'm one of the most optimistic of anyone I've ever met. So it's like when you look at this from a logic point of view, we're screwed. But I know in my heart that we're fine, yeah. you know, and and he has not got that conviction. I feel sometimes he get inspired by listening to me, even though one time. He said that, my God, listening to you is like listening to one of these Miss America speeches. You know? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But I feel that I'm doing everything I can. And my intention is pure. My intention is very clear. I want this whole world in peace and balance and beauty. And uh, I hope I'm, I'm part of it. Otherwise, it's all for nothing. But at least I did what I could and I'll die proud of myself. When it comes to Chip, he's much more cynical, uh, and he knows the forces. He knows the darkness. That's why I asked the question, because he was in the system, so he knows exactly what it is that uh, that we're up against. But he also knows what he's done. He's no, you know, he's very aware of that he has a price to pay. He he told me. I asked him very direct, you know, and he said. Uh, He's had a, I mean, he, this is a man who's been part of at least 14 or 17 assassinations on top of all the rest of what he's done. But he was a military guy. He was under order. 
believing for a long time in what he was doing. I get it. I mean, as to why you pursue it, because it's the same reason why I pursue it. People ask me many times, like, why do you, why do you do that? I mean, why do you do a blog every day? Why do you do these radio shows? Why do you talk about this stuff? You know, I don't know. It's just something that um, is just in my DNA, which mm. says that I have to pursue the truth. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's not not pursuing the truth. It doesn't even enter into the equation. You know, it's just something that motivates you, and it, it's just implicit in your makeup to want to continue to get the truth out there, you know? So it's not one of those things like you're just like, well, you know what? I think I'm just not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to go back to being in the virtual reality. I and mean, that's the problem is that once you go down this path and once you start unraveling the truth and you start digging into rabbit holes, there is no going back. You can't go back to the fake world anymore. No. You know? Yeah. It's like how to unlearn to be able to ride a bicycle. You can't do it. Once exactly. you know it, there's no way back. And and this is the thing. I mean, now this is my life, but I would do it anyway. I mean, I've done the first maybe a hundred interviews I did was from a bathroom. You know, I put I had the computer on on the the toilet and a chair in front of it, and then a blanket on top to avoid the echo. I had no idea if anyone was listening. Or if it made any kind of change or, uh, you know, I was just yeah. sitting there doing my best. And had I not heard back from anyone, I would still continue doing it. Well, you just keep going, Ollie. Yeah, you, you, you try and stop that. me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's um, you're one of the real good guys out there. And, you know, you just keep pushing the envelope um, to to reveal the truth and pull that curtain back. And uh, if it wasn't for people like yourself... Uh, much of what we know today, we wouldn't have uh, a lot of the information because you have, you know, broken the code on a lot of stuff. I don't know if a lot of people realize that, but you have, and I know that, you know, and so I'm really appreciative of everything that you do. Thank you, Mike. Anyway, I have talked you and derailed you here uh, for almost two hours. <laughs> it's a, Excellent. Yeah, that was a very good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Is there anything else, Oli, that you wanted to, um, to talk to the audience about before we wrap up? I would like to say if anyone would like to support or have an energy, an exchange of energy, because this is, uh, I, I need to tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> I was at the Open Mind Conference in Denmark and there's a Danish friend of mine who he's a former drag racing uh, driver who is now a horse whisperer. <laughs> so that, uh, okay, that's quite okay. an interesting turn of, of uh, career. Anyway, so uh, I was staying with them, and uh, when uh, when we got dinner, there was a there were wine glasses, and on my wine glass it said Apache, and I've always been really, really, uh, I've had a strong connection with the Apache tribe and the Sioux tribe. These two tribes I've felt in my heart uh, many times, you know, and so I thought, oh God, how did you know? I said, and he said, no, 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 that's uh, that's the name on my horse. We got like four horses, and so the different wine glasses had the different names. So I said, Apache, wow. And uh, so I said, after dinner, maybe, maybe would you mind? I would so like to just see how you communicate with horses because I had no, I have no idea. So um, he said, yeah, sure. So we went out afterwards, and Apache is a big, it's a really big white horse. Uh, and I, I, I was bare feet. And uh, so... Uh, and he was quite sort of like pushy, you know, when he came, he was sort of like pushing me around a little bit and, and eating on my sweater and stuff like that. And then uh, my friend Bjarne, he said, uh, do you want to ask him a question? I said, yeah. He said, uh, just repeat a question in your mind. Don't tell, don't say anything to me. Just repeat it in your mind and let's see what happens. So at that time, I was on my knees, you know, I was burned out. I was, uh, because there's so much out, 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 you know, giving out, 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 and so little coming in, what we talked about before. Yep. So I asked, how am I going to turn this around? Because I'm, I'm almost burned out here. Uh, and when I, uh, when I started asking the question, this horse just stopped fooling around and lowered his head in between the two of us. His, uh, the horse's ears went back and he stood totally, completely still. 
my friend Bjarne, who I had not said the uh, the question to, he said, Apache wants you to upgrade your website. <laughs> I was like, what? He said, <laughs> you need to open up a membership area. You need to make new avenues so that there can be an exchange of energy because you're going under. You're, there's no receiving energy. It's just going in one direction. He says you need to make new ways, maybe in the form of, like I said, membership areas and make donations, a newsletter, these type of things so that people can support you in the efforts because it's for the good of all. And then uh, Apache said, uh, now we are in touch. The only thing you need to do is uh, think my name, put a question out there, I'll help you. And then the horse just head up and took off. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, what the hell just happened? You know, did, did a, a horse just advise me on web design? I was like, <laughs> but I tell you, I, I went straight back home and I started upgrading my website. I'm still in the process of, of doing that, you know, to, and after that, there was a distinct change, you know, where suddenly I started receiving donations and so on. Uh, okay, great, great. So uh, yeah, this is the only income I have. So my my newsletter donations extremely appreciated. Uh, also, I'm I'm giving sessions one on one if people want to do that because it always starts about uh, conspiracies, but it ends up spiritually. You know, people are really uh, empowered. I'm empowered as well after an hour. Uh, and uh, so it's beautiful to watch. I'm really, I, I love being part of it. So the one-on-one -on -one sessions, Oli, is that you talking to, uh, is it a client then? Do you have a client? Yeah, anyone who contacts me, I call it Pick My Brain. And <clears throat> okay. then okay. I charge 60 euros an hour. And whatever you want to ask, go for it. And often it's an hour and a half or whatever. Uh, and... Uh, so that is another income. Oh, my books on, on Amazon, the, the several there. And how is Kim's book doing? How, how's she doing? It's, it's moving, but it's, it's a matter of marketing. The, the, yeah. You know, yeah. there is a reason why people, uh, at a publishing company that they have a whole team of people that are really good at what they're doing because to come from the outside and try to make any kind of impact, not easy. So, well, that's what we were saying before about this is not, you know, a get rich type of um, profession. Nope. Nope. <laughs> so far, not. But, uh, but I tell you, uh, one thing that my Raja Yoga teacher, that is Yoga for the Mind, I've got a beautiful teacher. Her name is Nelani Chelaram. And she welcomes wealth in all different areas of life. She says, do not block it off in any way or form. You know, welcome it in because then you can also make a bigger difference, you know, because there's a lot of help needed out there. And if you get, if you also have the financial, uh, means so much better, you know, so there's no point of, of being uh, broke or poor for no, no reason. And, and, uh, I, I can just say that, uh, money coming in that doesn't go to my family to keep us and will go back out there and do good in the world that i can promise well excellent Oli. yeah excellent uh great conversation i'm glad we we finally connected and uh it's been my fault folks because i was telling Oli before the show that i have just been very busy with other stuff in life <laughs> but um i'm glad we connected and um of course you know this. You have an open invitation to come back anytime and talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. Thank you so much. My website is lightonconspiracies.com. That is conspiracies in plural because, as you know by now, there's more than one going on. But they all are connected. Most most of them are connected. This is the this is the what makes it uh, possible to cope with because it doesn't matter if you look into GMOs or chemtrails or false flag operations or, or whatever, it comes by oh, pedophile trafficking that we were, was going to touch on as well. It, it all comes back to the same little group, as far as I know, which is called the New World Order, the people behind the New World Order agenda. So would it be okay for you if I finish with a prayer? 
Absolutely. Okay. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who heard us, be filled with peace and joy, love and light. Victory through that light. Because the thing is, they need to heal as well. If if they do not heal, then this mess will just continue. So we need to do it together. And I think when you look at, especially after when the apartheid regime went down, when they had the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that went around um, making former torturers and victims meet, former police, ANC members meet, and heal. I mean, I've seen examples of how former enemies are now working side by side, and so it's beautiful to see. So, imp- difficult, yes. Impossible, no. So, I say, good time to be alive. I agree, Oli. I agree. So, uh, again, I want to thank you again for, for coming on the show. And uh, maybe what we can get together uh, in the next few weeks or so, we can get to talk about the the whole pedophile mechanism that's in place. I mean, it, it's really reared its ugly head here in the United States. I mean, it had been rearing its head in a very ugly way in Europe, especially uh, in, in the UK for a long time. But people are really starting to... Um, become aware of this nastiness here. And I, I think it's, a, you know, finally, it's about time that people are seeing what the underbelly of the beast is really all about. And maybe, you, you know, you and I could talk about that. Anytime, Mike, anytime. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests, websites, and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.